Welcome to the Tom Nelson Podcast. I have David Legates here. And David, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a climatologist currently retired from the University of Delaware. I grew up in Delaware. I got all my degrees from the University of Delaware. Then I left. I went to the University of Oklahoma for a decade. I taught. I was on sabbatical leave at the University of Virginia. I then left and went to Louisiana State University for about a year and a half and then came back to the University of Delaware, and I'm still in the state. My okay. research has largely been on precipitation and statistics, so I was involved in the climate program and in the statistics program, both at the University of Delaware. Do you want to talk about your time in the swamp? Do you want to lead with that? I can talk about that, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was sort of an interesting discussion. I came in at the end of the Trump administration. It was September 8th. I remember the day. It's like a day for me that will live in infamy. September 8th of 2020. And I lasted until the Trump administration ended in the beginning of 2021. So it was four months. Effectively, I was brought in to sort of shepherd the National Climate Assessment along. But they figured out they had put me in the wrong location. I was in NOAA. NOAA was the controlling agency, but that's not where the National Climate Assessment gets produced. So later on, I got transferred and became the executive director of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which was over in the White House. And I was there for nine weeks, of which one was Thanksgiving, one was Christmas, one was New Year's, one was the American Meteorological Society meeting, and one was the last week of the administration where we all went back from whence we came. So I was really only active for four weeks, but it was four weeks of finding about how government works and why I'm glad that I'm no longer there. What other skeptics were part of that team that was brought in or brought in? Late was Ryan Maui. He and I came in late. There were a couple other people that were appointed before then. Many of them I wouldn't necessarily refer to as skeptics, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, I think the Trump administration waited too long to sort of make changes of the political people. And so a lot of deep staters were actually still part of the political crowd when they shouldn't have been. Is there any explanation as to why he waited to kind of the last minute to do that? I think it's some of the people, I mean, that should have been done by the head of commerce who then appointed the head of NOAA and then the head of NOAA should have made sure that these pe the people were changes. But in a lot of cases, I think, for example, there were people that were appointed that were there because they thought they would be pleasing to both sides. Let me put it that way. And so rather than upset the apple cart and create issues, we'll just sort of let status quo sit. And that's not the way to run a government. Okay. And you've said that you are not interested in trying this again in some future administration? I don't think so. This was an interesting discussion. Unless they change the way it's, things work in government, and I don't think that's likely to happen, then probably I am not the person that should be involved. Were you able to work at all on anything while you were there? No, it was this yeah. magic, how can I explain it? It was like a three-dimensional game of chess. We were trying to push things forward, we being me and Betsy Weatherhead, who had been hired to be the director of the National Climate Assessment. And we were trying to push things along, but the deep state mantra was essentially that it, things weren't moving because I had been brought in specifically to stonewall the process and therefore that they couldn't get things done. So that's why they were woefully behind. So instead of having a cadre of people, they would have just a handful of people contracted from North Carolina State University to do the work. And in the meantime, we're the ones pushing, but being blamed for holding it back. On the other hand, they're the ones saying we've been trying to push, but we're actually the ones holding it back. So it's it was this weird fight from the beginning. Do you think there's any hope for rooting out the climate alarmism from the federal government, or are they just so embedded that they're it's not going to so come out? It's so embedded. It's the deep state. I know a lot of people like to refer to it as a swamp. I refuse to refer to it as a swamp because a swamp is a viable ecosystem. I refer to it more as a cesspool because a cesspool is, contains human refuse, and that's more or less what I think it is. But it's not just those people. The problem, too, is that, for example, at the U.S. Global Change Research Program, I found they were all employees of UCF International, which is was originally created back, I think, in, in the 1960s, late 1960s, 1970, to try to get Black businesses government contracts. They quickly disbanded from that, and now they're a personnel supplier to the government. So in a sense, they are not employed by the government, but they're paid through the government. And of course, this is the equivalent of having like the Sierra Club 
put in employees that are then running portions of the government instead of giving the money directly to the to the Sierra Club, for example, or other environmental organizations. They give to this group that then actually puts people back into the administration. And I just thought this is, yeah, this is wild. So do you think it's true that both the Republicans and the Democrats are on board with the climate alarmism and even the Republicans don't want to push back because their donors want them to be on board with alarmism? Yeah, like I said, there were a lot of people that had been appointed through the Trump administration that really just wanted to, felt that the climate issue was like the third rail. Don't touch it. it it's going to get us in trouble. So they, they were picking people for positions that would be pleasing to both sides. And in fact, one of the members of NOAA, when I left and the person that was in charge before came back to the U.S. Global Change Research Program, his quote was, there, you know, I'm glad that Le Gates is gone because now we can bring things back to a non-political basis. And it's like, yeah, OK. So these are people who are supposedly on your side, and that's the kind of things they're saying. So I, I don't really... There's not too many people over there I trust. I watched your speech at Heartland, and I think you said you faced some charges after you were in the White House? Well, yeah, it's, yeah. There, there's a, it's a long story I won't yeah. go into, but effectively, I was asked by the Trump White House at the end to put together some flyers on climate change. We put together nine flyers, like one was talking about sea level rise, talking about solar radiation inputs, or hurricanes, and things like that. And they were written by top-notch people that you've had on your show. And so it's based upon the science. I was given the ability to use the Office of Science and Technology Policy logo from Ryan Maui, who was then essentially second in command at uh, OSTP. And he had gotten clearance through the, the chief of staff at OSTP. OSTP is the Office of Science and Technology Policy. But of course... Somebody at NOAA filed a complaint with Commerce and that I had used these illegally and that that was punishable by no longer than five years in jail and $5 million fine. That was written up in the Wall Street Journal in the Washington Post. But if you read down to like paragraph 18, it said we talked to people in the White House and they said that he had been authorized to do this. So the question is, what about the other 17 paragraphs? You just said there's nothing to see here, but the previous 17 paragraphs were all how this was all done to undermine climate science through the Trump White House. So, and nothing ever became of it. I mean, there was an investigation by the inspector general and they decided there was nothing to see here. Please move along. But of course, there is no retraction in the papers. So if you had the power of the presidency or somehow you could clean this up, what would you do to restore sanity on the climate issue in the federal government? The problem is it's all ingrained. There are yeah. people that are making so much money, so much fuel essentially from this climate change issue that to, to get them out to get a, a truly unbiased issue is nearly impossible. Betsy Weatherhead came in as the new director of the National Climate Assessment. She's not a political appointee, she's a government appointee. So she lasted beyond the end of the Trump administration. And early on, she and I sat down on the telephone because it was COVID and discussed where we were. And I told her you know, my views on climate change. And she essentially said, I agree with you on everything you said, except that I believe that carbon dioxide is more of an existential threat to the planet than you do. But my concern has been that the National Climate Assessment is very one-sided and biased, and we need to get a variety of viewpoints into it. And that's my goal, is to broaden this out and get a number of different viewpoints in. We found out that, it, that the National Climate Assessment is actually overseen by a steering group. And the steering group contains members of the 13 people from the 13 agencies that oversee the National Climate Assessment and the U.S. Global Change Research Program. It turned out, they said, in order to propose a change like you're doing, you have to propose it on one month. The next month's meeting, we will discuss it. And then the third month's meeting, we will vote. And they conveniently scheduled the first month's meeting on Inauguration Day so that I would be out. But it turned out, of course, you can't do business on Inauguration Day. That's a federal holiday. So they moved it to the next day. And like I said, I, I was gone by that point. But my understanding is she presented this in January. In February, it was discussed. In March, it was voted upon. And by the April meeting, she was fired. 
So it probably didn't go well. Would it be possible for some, if it was a DeSantis or somebody to come in and just fire a whole bunch of people and put in uh, well, technically, a new set of people? And technically, no. that's exactly right. I mean, the U.S. Global Change Research Program has this ICF international group, but they can be changed. And it just means somebody has to come in and say, we're going to re-advertise for it. We're going to bring in people that are less biased, a group that that, that is... But but I don't think, see, I've talked to a lot of people, they don't understand, and I didn't either until I got in there, that this group exists, that this is how it's working. They just thought the national assessment was, you know, the director makes a decision, gets some people to write it, they, you know, they work it out and then publish it. And if we get a director that's more open, that then for the the national assessment would be a broader assessment and be a much more uh, much less one sided view. It's not. There's all these other people involved. They are making money on climate change. They've got access to grind. They're in it because they're true believers or they're they're mercenaries, whatever the case may be. But they're in it because of this issue. And so it's going to take an awful lot of rooting these people out and cleaning up the system before anything gets better. But there's this to worry about. There's all sorts of other things in the government going on. I mean, it's just somebody would have to come in and spend a full-time effort changing the government. And you know that's not going to go over well. Okay. But at least a new president could appoint cabinet heads that aren't all in on the climate scam. At least that would help, right? That would definitely yeah. help. I mean, if you yeah. get somebody yeah, that's, that's willing to go that route, then under pe the people they are putting in underneath are going to be same mind, same thought. So who decides who is going to represent the U.S. and the IPCC, or how do the lead authors get their positions? The lead authors are essentially selected by the director, but then have to be approved by the steering group. So effectively, you know, when you have the director and the U.S. GCRP that are alarmist, and the steering group is alarmist, then all you get are alarmist people being picked. I mean, that's the other argument, is I got to see the full list of people that were in, and there are very few true, I would, I would say, stellar scientists in name, either on either side. Many of them were graduate students or new faculty that needed, where we're going to need tenure. Boy, this would be an excellent uh, ribbon for me to wear as I was an author on the National uh, Association, of, or excuse me, the uh, National uh, Climate Assessment. And, uh, you know, th th but those aren't, aren't the people you really want writing the thing. You want people who are the true scientists on all sides, sort of like the NIPCC looks like, a much more broader, a much more, you know, nuanced, but no, that's not what we're getting. So I should know this, but I don't. Is there what is the connection between the National Climate Assessment and the IPCC? Are they they are completely different. The IPCC yeah. is run through the UN. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it includes the US, Canada, the United Kingdom, all of the countries that are allowed to join the UN or, or are part of the UN. The National Climate Assessment comes from 1990, I believe. There was a, a part of what created the the Environmental Protection Agency also created this request for a national climate assessment. I think the first national climate assessment was largely written by Tom Carl and people at the National Climate Data Center in Asheville. And it's sort of morphed. It's There's a requirement every five years we're supposed to do an update. And so this, this is how we got there. So it's the U.S. version of the IPCC. And have you contributed, other than your time in the White House there, did you work on the National Climate Assessment or the IPCC at any time? Early on, I provided commentary to the IPCC until I found out that they, they like the National Climate Assessment, are under no requirements to take any of the comments you get with any grain of salt. So if I say, you know, this is patently wrong and here's why, if I were doing this for a journal article, the author would have to either make the change or explain to the editor why this change wasn't made. If you do that to the National Climate Assessment or to the IPCC report, they simply can ignore you and proceed without you. And so why waste your time if you know they're going to simply ignore you? You know, I think I have seen some of the comments, the IPCC comments. I think they're in one huge PDF file or something. Do you think they yeah. deliberately make it hard for people to actually go in there and read them? It seemed that, like that to me. Uh, yeah. And there's no, you know, and normally what you would have to do it with a normal peer review is if somebody provided commentary, you would have to respond to the commentary about this is how I addressed it, or this is why I don't, I think the reviewer is wrong and make your own statement. None of that's ever in there. They're just, here are the comments. And this is the final document. 
You don't know which comments they used, which comments they didn't. Obviously, if one says, you know, this this shouldn't be in here, it's a discredited article. And then you go over into the document and the article is front and center. They obviously ignored that comment. So, But it's difficult to track all that down. You're exactly right. There was a time in the good old days when Richard Lindzen was a lead author, right? In the IPCC at some point? Yeah. And in fact, yeah. I, somebody once told me, you know, I don't know why you're not a lead author. Well, I think we know why. <laughs> that was Tom Wigley, actually. But really? Anyway, yeah. Well, people weren't talking about you in the Climate Gate emails or were they? Was that in there somewhere? Oh, oh yeah, they were. Bob Davis was at the University of Virginia and he was a colleague of mine in grad school at the University of Delaware. And we had written a paper regarding an article that we, Sander and Wigley had written. And the reason this was important was because that was the the citation that was used in the second IPCC report, where the the magic line, the um, preponderance of the evidence suggests a discernible human influence on the climate. You probably remember that sort of magically got inserted into the document after the approval process. The second, essentially, the IPCC requires you to go line by line and every country has to approve it. And so after they'd done this, we know Tim Worth and a couple of other people demanded that there were certain things be added. And this was one of the lines that was not approved, but was added. And so there was all questions of how it got in there. And Fred Singer talks about it in his book quite a bit, Hot Talk, Cold Science. But one of the things we saw was that there was a citation to two papers by Sander Wigley and a bunch of their colleagues, which was the centered pattern correlation coefficient. And the crux of the paper was that Sander and the colleagues had taken observations and they had looked at them over time. These are upper atmospheric temperature fields. And then they took the climate models and they said, over time, the climate models are doing this. And when you pair the two, the correlation between the two gets higher over time. So they said, so the observations are becoming more like the models, which means that since the models are being driven by carbon dioxide, by black soot, and by ozone, then those three factors must be what's driving the observations, and that proves the dis- discernible human influence on the climate. Well, we took a look, look at it from a statistical standpoint. I think Pat Michaels and Chip Knappenberger looked at it from the time series perspective, and they had chosen the data set, if I'm correct, from like 62 to 1987. The data set actually runs from 1959 to 1995 at the time. And if you use the whole data set, the correlation goes down, up, and down again, almost in a letter N. And so they had cherry-picked the time period. But we looked at the correlation coefficient. And what I said is, you could, because of the way they did their averaging and so forth, you could take two fields that were identically the same and over time have them become more different. And the correlation, the way they've defined it, actually would increase. So the statistic is worthless because it's not showing you what they're claiming it's showing you. And when we 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 published that, I found out later that there was a comment came back from Wigley, and he complained about the paper and so forth. And we wrote a response, and the editor said, I don't think your response adds anything to the discussion, so we're not going to print it. But what we found out with the Climate Gate emails is that Wigley had written to the editor and said, you never should have published this. I don't know why you didn't send it to me first, because I would have made sure that this paper never saw the light of day. So what we're going to do is we're going to prepare a reply, and we're going to publish it as a paper. And when they try to comment, you just make sure that their comment never gets printed. So that was the the collusion, if you will, to use the word of the, of the time, that, that has been going on between climate scientists and editors to guarantee that discussion in these refereed articles is not what you really think it is. Boy, that, that's amazing stuff. So that brings to mind the IPCC summary for policymakers is written behind closed doors, or it's approved behind closed doors, right? The public can't listen in. I, know I, I don't know. I don't know if that's behind closed yeah. doors, but it, it, there's there's two processes. There, as as Lindzen has said, on the one ta- one hand, you've got like this big hallway, and at one end of the hall, you've got people in a room developing the IPCC scientific assessment. And they're scientists. And so they're putting in all of the caveats, the if, ands, or buts, and doing all the the scientific type document you would expect. At the other end of the hall are the people writing the summer for your policymakers. You would assume they would be taking the science and saying, 
all right, let's simplify this for people who aren't scientists. So they're not. They're writing their own document. And so in many cases, they would write a document, and Dick said they would run back to the science and say, can you change your science document to read the following? Because it would sound so much better on our end if you did this. You know, the scientists, you know, Dick was like, no, wait, wait a minute. This is, you know, the cart driving the horse. And, but that's that's unfortunately the way that process works. But at the end, once the summary for policymakers has been approved, it goes before the full board. And I don't whether this is done openly or in, in hiding, I don't know. But each state has the right, each state being country, has the right to say yes or no, I don't want that in there. And so that that document reflects the wishes of all of the countries of the world, not necessarily the science that exists. But, but who are the people from the countries that are making the yes, no decision? I mean, do they understand oh, the climate of the earth? Oh, no, they're, yeah. they're representatives. Like Christiana Figueres, I think, was a, she was head of well, COP25, and she is an anthropologist. So these people aren't necessarily, certainly aren't climatologists in most cases. And in many cases, they may not even be scientists. And the process has a built-in lag on purpose, right? That they do the summary for policymakers, and then there's a lag so that they, go, they can go back in and change this underlying science. I, I've heard that. Yeah, I think early on the science document yeah. came out, the summary came out later, and now they've decided we're going to release the summary first and then the science document later because, of course, very few people ever st spend time with a science document. I mean, that's monstrously thick. The summary is what you would expect, a summary. It's just not the cliff notes of the larger document. And so you put the summary out there, everybody reads it. This is what the IPCC says. By the time the actual document appears, you know, everything's passe. Why, why why worry about it? Do you think the IPCC process is going to continue for many more decades? Because I had Ken Green on here and he was thinking maybe it won't. Maybe they're going to have to at some point back off because the earth isn't warming like it was supposed to. And I don't do know. Think? I think I think they'll keep making things up. I mean, I've seen this constant uh, re reassessment of in particularly with U.S. records of making the old temperatures colder, making the new temperatures warmer when in fact the biggest signal should be an urbanization effect. So if you're going to adjust for urbanization, you would want to make the new values cooler and make the older values warmer to at least compensate for what's been taking place over time. I, I'm a pessimist, not a fatalist, but I'm a pessimist by nature. And so my thought is they will continue to do so for the end of time until somebody gets in that's different and has a different agenda and viewpoint. Do you have any sense as to out of all these scientists or people that do comments, they submit comments to the IPCC report, what percent of them would read the summary and give it a thumbs up that they agree with everything that's in the summary? That I have no idea, because yeah. like I say, a lot of people have, have decided not to provide comments simply because it's a complete waste of time. So it, it would be like producing a podcast and then throwing away yeah. the video. Nobody sees it. What's the difference? And so why should I waste my time commenting on it when nobody's going to see it? Okay. So you think that is a shift over the last 10 or 20 years that a lot of uh, people like yourself are just not bothering with the, the commenting on, anymore? I, I think it's, so. Yeah. I I, okay. I didn't last long enough to see the comments see perspective. So I don't know to what extent we got comments yeah. or they will receive it, which they're receiving right now, actually. I okay. think it's just closed. But in any event, uh, no, I didn't see how that was pl that played out. At some point, I saw a lot of comments from Christopher Moncton in there. I don't know if he's working on that anymore or... If He's concluded, like you, that it's not worth his time? I don't know. That I don't know. I know he's had some health issues, so that may have taken him out of out of the, the forefront of fighting back. Okay. Generally, in the whole uh, scientist world, that uh, from your perspective, do you think people think we're it's a climate crisis right now and CO2 is the climate control knob, weather's getting worse, all this bogus stuff? Do they believe No. It? No, I don't. And in fact, many people who will come to me at meetings and so forth and say, you know, I agree with you. But I'm not going to speak out because, you know, I've got textbooks out. And if I if I come out as a denier, so to speak, that my textbook will fall. I don't want my dean yelling at me. Life is good for me at the university. I see how it could be worse, particularly with the universities becoming woke and particularly how, you know, I was treated at the university. So in a sort of sort of a sense, don't let this happen to me. So I'm just going to be quiet and go go my own merry way. And I think that's a shame because the assumption always is silence gives consent. So the 97% consensus are the people who aren't speaking up, but clearly the people are not are speaking up uh, are not in the minority, I believe. 
I get the sense from the outside that there's quite a few scientists that are just running out the clock, waiting for retirement, and they don't want to rock the boat. And then maybe they'll speak once they retire. It seems like it. That's right. I, there's been a number of them that that were sort of either on board or at least uh, non-committal that after they retired said, you yeah, know, let me tell you some stories. And for many of them, it didn't go well. They were then immediately ostracized, immediately ousted. Didn't matter. They've got you know retirement and so forth. But I think a lot of them say, you know, I'm just going to be attacked and I don't need this. And I, you know, I've retired, you know, I'm 65, 70, whatever. I've had a good, good career. I want to re relax. I don't want to be hounded by the media, have my name called, you know, be called names in the press. I I'm just going to turn my head and walk away. How about this whole uh, strength in numbers idea, though, that if more people raise their hand and say this is ridiculous, that they'll get attacked less? I have some hope that maybe people will speak up and that'll happen. I, I have some hope of that, too. And I think that the the parallel for this, I think, is the Trophim Lysenko incident. I mean, if you remember that, maybe some of your viewers don't. The issue is that Trofim Lysenko was a Soviet peasant, and he came up with this brilliant idea that if you take seeds and you freeze them, and then you put them in the ground, the plants that grow from it will actually be co more cold tolerant than if you didn't do that. And of course, it flew in the face of Mendel's genetics, which then became ostracized. So all the people studying genetics and that were geneticists and predisposed to that were ousted from the universities. They were pro persecuted, some were killed, fled the country. And so this new sort of environmental determinism, if you will, of freezing, you know, of changing the, the seeds and then the plants would change accordingly was sort of how Soviet agriculture developed. And of course, as you know, it didn't develop well because genetics was correct and this was not. And it wasn't until, I keep getting the right, I think it was Brezhnev back in 64, finally came along and said, you know, we're going to have to give this up and go back to genetics and doing a more scientific-based organ assessment. And my thought is, you know, it took a whole cohort of scientists and a whole generation to pass away before somebody finally said, okay, we're going to have to stop and go back. And maybe it won't take that long here, but I think once we start to see that, like in your background, all that snow, you know, the snow that was supposed to never happen by, you know, 2010, 2020, we won't see snow again. We'll start seeing a lot of snow. We'll start seeing cooler temperatures. The earth will stop warming. They can't continue. Somebody will say, wait a minute, maybe this net zero stuff isn't where we should have been going in the first place. Let's reconsider. And I'm hoping we get there sooner than later. Yeah, I mean, the total insanity has lasted for a long time now. It's been 35 years almost now since Hansen started sweating there in that, yeah. in that Senate hearing. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe maybe that is a generation. So maybe we are headed towards the end of that. I hope so. How about the general public? I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but uh, as I walk around and talk to people, I don't see people that are all in on it hardly ever. It almost never comes up. It seems like it would help that since the public doesn't believe in it, that the government goes off on its own and continues pounding on it. If if the voters aren't into it, then eventually it's got to go away. I think that there are some that, that I run into from time to time yeah. that, that seem to have, have drunk their Kool-Aid. Yeah, I guess it wasn't Kool-Aid technically <laughs> down there, but uh, we call it Kool-Aid. But in any event, yeah, I think there are some that, that think that that's the case. But we have tried to indoctrinate schools. We have tried to, you know, from kindergarten through college, you get, oh, you know, climate change, climate change, climate change, climate change. After some point, you tend to believe it. But then when, you know, when people start to, you know, I think the older generation has lived long enough to realize, wait a minute, it wasn't quite, you know, it wasn't like really cold back then and really warm now. I do remember, you know, getting hurricanes and tornadoes back then, and we do get them now. And wait a minute, what's happening? And particularly when they start saying, you can't have gas or diesel cars, you have to pay more for electricity. The new thing I think right now is to get rid of all natural gas powered uh, stoves and fireplaces. I mean, it's just, you know, wait a minute, do I really have to go through all this to save the planet? And then I think most of them are saying, no, I don't think the planet really needs saving to that extent. I've heard from multiple people that the number one thing that's going to cause this to die is just a simple passage of time. And they keep saying apocalypse is coming in 10 years and it just never, never, ever comes. It seems like when the kids that were fed this when they were 12, they get to be 30 and still nothing has happened. I, I think at some point 
it's got to die. And, and that's the same thing yeah. with Lysenko. I mean, yeah. you know, it sounded good at the time, yeah. but when agriculture kept falling farther and farther and farther behind, you have to rethink what you're doing. And I think that's exactly, hopefully, where we're yeah. arriving. Okay. But you said the length of that one was maybe three decades or something. Just trying to get from, a rule of thumb uh, here. Maybe from the probably. early 30s right. to the mid 60s. Okay. There you uh, go. Yeah. So that's maybe 30, 30 some years. Okay. So maybe we have run the course. Maybe this is time for change. We've mentioned the climate gate issue in particular. That was one of the interesting change points with me at the University of Delaware. I mean, I go back to 1978 when I was a freshman at the university, and I've been affiliated with the university indirectly even the 11 years that I was faculty at the University of Oklahoma and at Louisiana State University. I was still working with people here, still had an email here. And then when I returned in 99, everything was fine up until I would say about November of 2009. If you remember back then, we had something we just talked about a moment ago called Climate Gate. So essentially there were all these computer files and emails and electronic documents released from the University of East Anglia. And so shortly thereafter, I think it was just about a month, I personally received a FOIA request from Greenpeace asking for all of my emails and everything I had done that was related to climate change, global warming, Michael Mann, all of that. And as a result, of course, this was the, the response to ClimateGate. It specifically said, based upon the illegal release of documents from the University of East Anglia, we are asking for a legal release of documents on people who have been skeptical of climate change. I found out there were four different universities targeted and seven different people. One was the University of Alabama Huntsville. John Christie and Roy Spencer were both listed. My understanding is the University of Alabama Huntsville's response was, go pounce. You're not entitled to FOIA documents and you're not going to get any and nothing ever happened. The second was the University of Virginia. They targeted Fred Singer and Pat Michaels. Fred was an interesting target because I'd been there in sabbatical leave in 94, 95, and Fred had long since departed UVA at that time. So clearly UVA had nothing from Fred to turn over. Pat had left, and I'll come back to that issue because that plays a role particularly with climate change going forward. The third place was me at the University of Delaware. And the fourth was Willie Soon and Sally Balayunas at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Harvard didn't do anything for a while. And then eventually they just turned over essentially all their personnel files of Willie. I don't think they turned over any computer generated material or any emails, but it was who he was getting his funding from, reports that he had written back in response and things like that. Mine was a little different. It did not go to the university. It did not go to the FOIA officer. It went to me personally as the Delaware state climatologist. Now, the interesting thing about this is the state of Delaware has a very simple FOIA regulation when it comes to the university. It simply says the University of Delaware and Delaware State University are exempt from state FOIA except as it relates to the operation of the Board of Trustees and the expenditure of state funds. The state climate office at the time was unfunded. So part of my, my duties as a faculty member were to make sure the climate office was running, but it received no money from the state. And we did no climate change research. We were doing you know real-time weather forecasting, real-time weather assessment for emergency management and so forth. So my thought is that based upon the FOIA there's just simply nothing to turn over. But what I decided to do, because I had to, was to turn this to the dean, and the dean sent it to University Legal Counsel, who was Larry White. He, Larry White was had been at the University of Virginia. He'd been at the University of Penn. He had been legal representative of the American Association of University Professors, the union. So he's not a newcomer to this. He's been around. You know, I remember he sat down with me and had a meeting, and I said, Really, Larry, I don't think there's anything here. They've not asked for anything from my university job. They've asked for me as state climatologist. We get no funding. We did nothing that that falls under their FOIA request. There's nothing to see here. And I said, or he said, well, here's the problem. I'm not going to be hamstrung by that decision. What I want to see is everything you have. That is, I want to see everything you've produced, whether it be at the university 
or on consultant or at home, whether it currently exists on university email accounts, or if you've got a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or AOL or CompuServe, I want all of that material, whether you have it in filing cabinets here at home, whether it's done through the university or in consulting, in essence, everything you do have done, I want produced at my office. I will then look at it and decide what what how we should interpret the law, which I thought was really backward. I thought you first interpret the law and figure out what you need to get, and then what do we have, and proceed that way, as opposed to saying let me let me rake everything up and then decide what what's from what I have. What do I what can I give away? I'm starting to put this together, and the interesting thing about it is that there comes out a, another email. Larry sends me an email, or I should say his colleague sends me an email, and she's writing back to Greenpeace, and she says, we have gotten all sorts of documents from Dr. Legates. It's just a matter of us going through and cataloging them all and getting them sent to you. We are going to do that forthwith, and you should be getting these shortly. To which Greenpeace responded, thank you very much. Look forward to your shipment. Well, I'm thinking, I haven't produced anything yet. What what could you possibly be handing off? And so at that point, I, you know, I suspected some issues were happening. I got another email from Larry. This is with, actually it contained a letter that was sent to him by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And what apparently they had decided is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if you're asking for material from Bill Gates, why don't we ask for material on somebody else at the university who was a member of the IPCC and an IPCC author who is a believer in climate change? And that will hopefully demonstrate the absurdity of all of this. Or in my case, it'll demonstrate the, the two-faced nature of how the university chose to work. Mm -hmm. So Larry sends us back, says, who are these people? This one will probably be answered with a simple no. And I'm thinking, what do you mean simple no? Why was it mine answered with a simple no? So about a week later, I get another one. And apparently he had not responded to the cooperative, the, the CEI. And in particular, he was supposed to within seven calendar days. So they wrote back and said, you know, we sent you this before. What is your response? And so Larry sent back to it and said, essentially, I have, the, he reads back the university's policy with FOIA and says, your request does not fall under state FOIA. Your request is hereby denied. And then 30 seconds later, he sends me a personal email that says, these people are starting to come out of the woodwork. Get me your stuff immediately. <laughs> so at that point, I said, uh, okay, I'm headed to Larry's office. So I went over to Larry's office and I said to Larry, okay, what gives? I said, your, your subordinate has sent, I didn't call her subordinate, of course, but I said, she has sent a request saying, you've got all these documents. You have no documents. Why did she lie? No, that's not, that's not what that phrase means. Well, what does that phrase mean? That's a legal term that we use. No, it's not a legal term. It says you've got information. I know how to read English. It says you've got information and you don't. So why did she write that? So we went back on that a couple of times. And then I said, you know, the, this other issue, why are you treating me differently? And he essentially said, son, you don't understand the law. The law says I don't have to produce any documents, but nowhere in the law does it preclude me from doing so. In your case, you will turn everything over to me. I and the dean will go through it and we will decide what to release to Greenpeace. Now, what don't you understand about that? And I said, okay, I guess I don't understand the law. Maybe I need to get an attorney. So I hired an attorney. So I hired an attorney. And I got this frantic call from the dean of the college, Nancy Target. And she said, I I've just heard from the, I've just heard from legal counsel. And they said, you've hired a lawyer. And I said, yes, Nancy, I have. And she said, well, you can't do that. Larry White is your lawyer. He works for you. And I said, he's not working for me. And you know very well, I have every right to hire my own lawyer, particularly because if I've got a dispute with you or anybody else at the university, I could go to the union and they would put a, give me a lawyer for one hour to discuss the case and whether or not I have any grounds of filing a lawsuit or not. So I can hire my own lawyer and the union will do that for me. 
Well, she said, no, you've got, you, this has put you at odds with the university. This college will no longer support anything you do. And at that point, I was told to step down from the state climatologist, which I didn't. So she removed me. I had created the Delaware Environmental Observing System, which was removed from my control. I was teaching introductory classes. They were removed. In fact, the chair of the department actually called a granting agency and asked the granting agency to change the PI on the grant from me to her. And I went to her and said, why did you do that? And she said, I have that right because I'm the chair of the department. Now get out of my office. So yeah, everything magically went horribly wrong. So the lawyer contacts Larry and says, why are you treating him separately? And Larry's response was, okay, let me do this. If Legates turns over materials now, and we both agreed that he had no right to ask for anything outside of university purview. Said if Larry Gates turns over the stuff immediately, and I've been I'm mad at him because he's been stonewalling me on this. But if he turns it over immediately, I will go to the other person and I will ask them to do the exact same thing. And so he sent a letter back to CEI and said, I will reconsider your request because the, my initial response did not take sufficient account of the legal analysis required under the act. Now remember, I have written, written sorry, I have read to you the actual verbiage, and it's one sentence. So he is a highfalutin lawyer. He should have been able to interpret what that, that meant. Instead, he said to CEI, okay, stuff is coming. Let me reconsider. So it turns out about two months later, White is on a panel, which is American Association of University Professors or AAUP workshop. There was a Supreme Court decision, which went five to four, called Garcetti versus Sebelos. And what happened in that law was, I believe, Garcetti made some statements that were pursuant to his position as a public employee, so he got fired. But he contended his First Amendment free speech allowed him to say that. And what the Supreme Court decision was, that no, he could be fired because at the time he was speaking as a public employee, not a private species citizen. So his speech really had no First Amendment rights. The question then comes back to universities, because some universities are, in fact, public universities, and some are private. The University of Delaware is a university that when you ask them the question, they say, who wants to know and why? The University of Delaware is a public university when it's in their best interest to be a public university. It, they are a private university when it's in their best interest to be a private university. They are what is called a state-supported university. About 12% of the budget comes from the state, about 88% comes from elsewhere. So they're not really a state university. They're not really a private university. They're state-supported. So the question was, how does this work? And so White is on this national AAUP panel, and they concluded that academic freedom was a principle vital to the effective functioning of institutions of higher learning. They urged faculty groups to minimize the dangers of this recent court ruling and avert, the, avert their reoccurrence by making administrators and governing boards aware of the risks to institutional health and to higher education generally if doctrines to curtail intramural faculty speech are employed. So the whole thrust of this is the danger that White was warning against was exactly the same tactic he was employing with me back at the University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. So because of this, the university became proactive. And so the University Faculty Senate passed an amendment to the faculty handbook to protect faculty speech. So the provost, Tom, who at the time, Tom Apple, proclaimed that the University of Delaware is now taking a leadership position on academic freedom. I strongly support the recent action by the Faculty Senate, which ensures that faculty are free to speak their mind without fear of reprisal, unless their statements or actions are unethical or incompetent. Academic freedom is essential to lively and open debate and discussion. Well, it says, without fear of reprisal, unless statements or actions are unethical or incompetent. First of all, who decides unethical or incompetent? But moreover, nobody has ever accused me of either. None of my research is under question. None of my teaching is under question. Nobody's filed a case. The only thing that's ever been filed is Greenpeace requesting all my materials and the university falling over backwards to try to make that happen. 
So what eventually happened is I provided the materials to them. And I talked to the other individual. He was actually a friend of mine at the university in our same department. And he said the colleague that had contacted Greenpeace before actually came and sat down and met with him. And she talked about how I was being attacked by Greenpeace, how they were going to get all my materials and my name would be mud once they found out all the oil and gas interest payments that I'd been making. And then she got up and left. And he said, I thought I was supposed to produce documents. I've been told nothing. So he said, I sent a letter back to or an email back to Larry White saying, what specifically do you want me to do? And to this day, Larry White has never responded to that email. He's provided no documentation. So clearly, Larry's statement to my lawyer that I will treat both of you the same, but you've got to do you've got to move first was really a ruse to get us to move and then ignore what happened afterwards. So hmm. what happened? I provided the materials and then nothing. For 15 months, nothing happened. Heard no more from Larry White, heard no more from anybody. So I sent a letter at one point to the lawyer and I said, what is, what's happening? He said, I think what's happened is Larry has stepped in it and he wants to figure out a way out and so what he's just going to do is pretend it never happened and hope it all goes away. That's not what happened. What actually happened is back at the University of Virginia, a fight broke out because what CEI had done at Delaware, Virginia delegate Bob Marshall had actually done at the University of Virginia. And he had picked Michael Mann as a member of the UVA Environmental Sciences Department. If you want material from Pat Michaels, then I would like to get materials from Michael Mann. Of course, you probably know that's where the public outcry ensued, that Michael Mann was being hounded by Republicans and the right who just want to try to run a good climatologist through the dirt, and this has got to be stopped. Of course, most people don't know that it started with Greenpeace demanding that Pat Michaels turn over everything. So... You see these magic statements that appear from all sorts of groups, from the union, the AAUP, to the American Meteorological Association, to the American Geophysical Union, all deploring this, saying how Michael Mann, a good upstanding scientist, has been attacked, and we cannot stand for this. Of course, Pat's name is never mentioned. It's all Michael Mann. The ACLU went a little bit farther. They issued a formal statement that encouraged the university to use every legal avenue at your disposal to resist providing the information demanded. They said documents and email communications that were part of an ongoing scientific discussion might be taken out of context and used to create an impression of wrongdoing. And it concluded that it is the university's obligation to protect academic freedom by seeing that legal tools are not used to intimidate scientists whose methods or conclusions are controversial. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just dripping with irony. So even, in fact, the union president at the time was Kerry Nelson, and he wrote that we are urging the University of Virginia to publicly resist the threat to scholarly communication and academic freedom that is represented by the concerted effort to obtain faculty emails. Whatever people may think of climate research, the climate for academic freedom must not be allowed to deteriorate. If scientists think every email they send may be subject to a politically motivated attack, it will create a chilling effect on their discourse and will hurt scientific research. So I got to thinking, we have a union here at the University of Delaware. Why don't I go to them with this statement and ask for their help? Now, I know what was going to happen, but I decided I want, you know, I want to be able to document their response. So I went to then president of the UD chapter, who is Joan Del Fattore. Now, she had written extensively on academic freedom and published an article in which she warned that once an administration silences any speech, it may be assumed that the university is endorsing whatever speech it failed to suppress. And then she concluded, if the Garcetti versus Sebelos case reinvigorate, sorry, reinvigorates faculty nationwide to take an activist approach to academic freedom once again, the effect will be to strengthen the free exchange of views that is essential to the quality and integrity of American higher education. So I sent 
that to her along her comments, along with the AAUP president, Carrie Nelson's comments to her. And essentially the answer I got back by email was a simple one st- one sentence statement that says, FOIA matters do not fall within the scope of the AAUP. If you're familiar with the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, I went to them as well. And I talked to their leader at the time, their head, that was Adam Kissel. And he said to me, we cannot support you because we have been supporting Michael Mann over at the University of Virginia. And it would it would look hypocritical of us if we supported him and then supported you. And I said, no, Adam, it would look hypocritical for you if you supported him and then refused to support me. Uh, Later, Adam stepped down. Somebody else came in. They were a little more interested. They turned this over to their attorney, David French, and David French advised them against supporting climate deniers. So as I said, nothing happened for 15 months. And so we had assumed that all of this was going to pass away. At the University of Virginia, there was a lawsuit to protect Michael Mann, and eventually Mann won. None of his records had to be turned over. Within five weeks of the conclusion of that lawsuit, I received another email from Larry White. He said now he had time, and he had hired a third-year law student to go through all my records. He said, we have interpreted the language of the Delaware FOIA law to mean that we are obliged to produce records, otherwise non-privileged, that pertain to work by Dr. Legates that is supported through grants from state agencies. As a result, everything he proposed to turn to Greenpeace fell in three categories. The first was emails regarding essentially, as you would expect, by state agencies through grants. Of all of my thousands and thousands of emails, the total number he selected was two. There was actually an email exchange I had with Michael Mann regarding the Ben Sander thing earlier on that I talked about. And Mann was very critical of Dr. Sander at the time, which would have been an interesting release had it come out. But he turned over only two email exchanges. The interesting thing is both of them were about federal funding, not state funding. The second set of things was, or sorry, I said the file also contained an invitation from a state agency to give a talk on climate change, for which I wasn't paid, and a report to the governor of the General Assembly on the Delaware Water Supply Coordinating Council. I had no hand in writing that. I was not on the board, on the council when it was written. In fact, it was given to me when I joined the council, and I'm not mentioned anywhere within it. But that also was to be turned over to Greenpeace. The second category of documents, he said the university was also obliged to produce. This is classroom-related work such as syllabi, instructional materials, and class postings, because a small portion of my salary was paid from state-appropriated funds. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment, because that's going to, well, that's something I need to talk about as well. But the interesting thing is if you go through the university faculty handbook, its own FOIA policy specifically includes requests for such materials. I, as a student, can't go to faculty and ask, give me all of your teaching materials. I want all of your previous exams, sizes, and everything with, just because you're a state-supported faculty, I want all of this. No. Teaching is always a joy, as it says, the full profession, full protection of academic freedom, particularly because administrators only can examine your materials for cause. In fact, what my lawyer didn't understand is that we are more like free agents than employees. When I left the university, I took everything that I had, all my teaching materials, and left nothing behind. Had I worked for the federal or state government, see, everything I would have developed as a part of the federal or state government stays behind because... It's, it was produced by the government. It's the government's property. The university doesn't see it that way. So all my teaching materials are mine and mine alone. And the person that comes in after me to teach my classes has got to develop their own courses themselves. So in this case, despite claiming that Larry was obliged to produce this stuff, he couldn't square what he was trying to do with official policy. And so he just tried to trivialize it by saying, these materials strike me as innocuous in the extreme and I propose them turn them to turn them all over to Greenpeace. 
There was a third group. This is where it gets interesting. What is FOIA about? FOIA is about transparency. So you get documents that the government, in theory, is using that you would normally have access to. FOIA, and ev everywhere you read about FOIA, they will tell you, FOIA is not to uh, force the government or some other group to do your work for you. If you want to do an internet search, you do an internet search. You can't make us do that. So stuff's available on the internet. All we have to say is, it's on the internet, go get it. But that's exactly what the third group of materials were. Essentially, this third-year law student was instructed to pull up Google, to put in my name, and to copy down every document and every web page that came up and produce that for Greenpeace. Now, if Greenpeace hadn't asked for public materials, and they certainly could have gotten all that material. But nevertheless, White said he would turn him over to Greenpeace only because it seems potentially provocative for me not to surrender such documents that are already in the public domain. So, in other words, claiming that it, having claimed it was harmless to violate my rights, he's now claiming it would be harmful not to violate my rights. I assume this has all been turned over to Greenpeace. I've never heard any more about it. My argument is that Greenpeace would never simply allow the university to walk away. And if the university had told Greenpeace, we've got things to send you, they're going to keep hounding them to send them. Now, whether they sent just this, whether he sent lots of other stuff, I don't know. But I do know there was nothing provocative. There was nothing shocking in any of my emails, in any of my documents. And Greenpeace has never gone public with any of them. So I'm sure that either they, they got them because they got something. Otherwise, they would have raised high heaven to get it. But there's clearly nothing in there that I ever had to worry about. Now, it finished by me going to the university because there was a little issue that came up before that said that I was funded by state funds. Now, the university gets, as I said, about 12% of its budget from the state. And way back when the university was essentially just putting that money in a big bucket with all, proverbially, with all the other money they got, and then you would pull out the money and spend it. And as long as the bucket doesn't go empty, everything is good. Well, after that, after a certain point, we couldn't do that. You have to track every dollar so that state money has to be tracked. How specifically were each of these dollars spent? So the university went back to the state and said, can we spend this on diesel fuel, on, let's say, lights for all the buildings? And the state said, no, you have to spend a certain proportion of it on faculty salaries because teaching is the mission of the university, and that's what we're paying you to do. So they came up with this scheme that essentially said, we will take all the faculty, and then any faculty we want to protect, we remove. The remaining group of faculty, we will randomly assign to become part of state supported until we run out of state money. So therefore, a certain group of those are state supported and a certain group aren't. And so I had a meeting with the university treasurer to explain this to me. And she said, they've come up with this idea. And so certain people are state supported and certain people aren't. And I said, where is this document? Because I don't see it in the faculty handbook. I see it nowhere on any university website or any university documents I've ever seen or have been given. And she said, well, it exists behind the scenes in administrative work. But the advantage is if you're on that list, you can ask to be taken off. Now, stop and think about this for a minute. Nobody knows this list exists. So you don't know whether you're on it or not. How are you going to ask to be taken off of a list that you don't even know exists. This effectively makes no sense whatsoever. So at the end, I asked what turned out to be the $64,000 question. I wish I'd gotten $64,000, but in any event, I asked the question that, and usually I'm, I'm always you know, walking down the street thinking, I should have asked this, but this time I actually asked the question. I said, so you're telling me, We've got two faculty members in adjacent offices in the same department. Both are at the same level. Let's say they're both full professors. Both have been to university for 30 years. They teach essentially the same thing. One happens to be on the list. Whether happens to be not on that list by, by the random chance. You're telling me if I follow FOIA on both individuals, the one that's on the list, I can get everything on them. 
And the one that's not on the list, I can't get anything at all. And she said, not quite. She said, the state's FOIA says state funded and the state only funds us for teaching, not for research, not for service. So the only thing they could get, you could get from that one individual would be teaching materials, but not research and not service. Now, Larry knows this. So then I asked the next question. I said, when did I become, am I state supported? And she said, yes, you are. And I said, when did I become state supported? And she said, I can't tell you that, but my colleague next to me can. And he said, I can pull it up on the computer. I can only go back to 2005. But when I get back to my office, I can go through hard copies and find out from the day you were employed in 1999. To make a long story short, when I came in in 1999, I was not state supported. In 2000, I was also not on the list. 2001, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, I was not on the list. Magically, the same semester that Greenpeace filed its FOIA was the first semester I was added to the list. So she said, do you have any further questions? And I said, no, I think you've been very helpful. Thank you very much. At which point Larry jumped up, slammed his chair off the wall and stormed out. So yes, that, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I've heard nothing from it since there have been no fallouts because like I said, I have nothing to hide, but the fact that the university went out of its way to try to get me when they were hiding other people. And the same thing to, to finish up at UVA, Pat, uh, Michael Mann fought, won the right not to have his released. Pat is still going to have all of his materials released. And Pat went to the university and said, here's the problem. In your faculty handbook, it specifically says you will not retain any materials from any faculty who have left the university employ. I've been gone for two years. The fact that you can go through old records and pull them out means you violated the faculty handbook. So if any of these ever reach the light of day, I will sue the university and I will definitely have a case. And Pat's never, well, Pat has never heard anything since then and the university released nothing. So clearly that worked. Uh, amazing stuff. Is this still going on at all? Any sort of FOIA battles right now? Uh, you- between me, I I assume people file FOIAs from time to time. I mean, there's a reason for it is to provide transparency in government. It is not to attack people. And as happened with me, and, it, and it's, I, I take it back. You, there, there was another incident. This was Representative Clealva from Arizona. He had said there are seven people. I don't know where this magic number seven keeps coming from. There are seven people he identified who had testified in Congress, and he wanted their full records. For the other six people, the university complied. The University of Delaware, why was one of them listed? was the only one who failed to comply. And I've always been asked, why did they fail to comply? And my answer is one of two things. They have, one, already released all this information. And secondly, they know very well if they release it again after all that's taken place, I will have a lawsuit. And so that's why I was the one person for which they never released any records, but the other six universities all did. Wasn't he the guy that was going to charge skeptics with racketeering or wasn't there? Yes. And that was part of it too. Once I find out that you've got all your money from oil and gas interests and see that was a racketeer that they brought you in to testify for them. And uh, yeah, I've often asked, you know, if I had this to do all over again, would I've gotten into climatology or would I've done something else? Because when I originally got into this, I, you know, I, I met with John Mather, who was at the University of Delaware, and I wanted to be a weather forecaster. I wanted to work at a weather a airport on forecast weather. And he said, you don't want to do that. This is like 1978. You don't want to do that. It's all going to be done by computers and it's shift work. You don't want to get into that. What you really need to do is get into climate change. That's going to be the big issue in the 1980s and beyond. Uh, applied climatology, how to use climate to solve problems and to you know solve issues of warming and cooling and things like that. That's what you need to get into. 
and we are building a program here at the University of Delaware. And I'd also applied to the University of Maryland, Penn State, and been accepted. So I'm not sure whether, you know, he's telling me a line or just selling me stuff. So I went over to the University of Maryland. I wa literally walked in off the street and I said, you know, I've, I'm interested in the program. Can I talk to somebody? And they said, sure. And they sent me, but an old gentleman turned out was Helmut Landsberg. He's a very famous climatologist. And I explained to him what I wanted to do. And he said, no, you don't. It's going to be shift. It's shift work. It's, it's going to be done by computers. You don't want to get into that. And he said, what you want to get into is climate change. And we don't do that here at the University of Maryland. I would encourage you not to come here. Now, I don't know too many people would say, don't come to my university. We don't do this kind of stuff. And I remember you know, talking a bit about him. And I said, I've also applied to Penn State. And he said, I, he said, I spent, I don't know how many years it was, but I was on the faculty at Penn State. They do a lot of weather forecasting, but they don't do climate stuff. And uh, I would encourage you not to go there. And then I said, well, I, the funny thing is I've heard this, this same speech before from John Mather at the University of Delaware. He said, I just reviewed that program. That's an excellent program. You should get in on the ground floor of it. And the, the, the final message I always say is, and so I've never been to Penn State. Interesting. Was the global cooling still on the radar then? or was In 78, it was. Yeah. That was the wish. I said, you know, when I got interested in this stuff, it was global cooling. But there was some issues as to, you know, why is the temperature dropping even with carbon dioxide going up? And of course, then it seemed to change in the late 70s. And then global warming became the big issue about a decade later. Well, uh, there will be another global cooling scare in the next, let's say, 70 years. Think that'll happen? <laughs> Probably. I mean, if somebody thinks they can make money off of it, then global cooling will be destroying the planet at some point in the future. I think that was why it didn't quite take off the first time it came around was because there was just no money to make on it. So it was an interesting thing to put in time in Newsweek, but it wasn't an interesting thing to, to start changing the economy over. But then when the environmentalists realized we could make money, we had moved to global warming and that's where we wound up. This is good stuff. You do have a podcast, right? That we have a podcast. I yeah. work with the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. We have a podcast called Created to Rain. That's R-E-I-G-N, not R-A-I-N. Uh, although I, I'm probably on April Fool's going to do one on Created to Rain and talk about clouds. But in any event, yeah, it's it's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts, wherever good podcasts are found like your, your own. Okay. Are you on any other social media or any other places we should look for your work? No, I stayed away from social media. When I went into the government, it, the lady was very pleased that I didn't have Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts. Said it makes my life, my work a whole lot easier in trying to get you a security clearance. But I probably at some point will create a, a web page and start putting some of this stuff up. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate this. It was really fun for me to hear about how things work on the inside. That it's a mystery. It's a black box to us from the outside. So, so. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you next time. David Legates. Thanks.